This is Isaka's Page 2 Podcast. Thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Colin Better and I am a training engineer here at Isaka. Joining me today is Tom Schneider and he is a senior associate of proactive advisory for Cyber Defense Labs. He is here to chat about his recently released ISACA journal article titled, Ensuring That Cybersecurity Is Everyone's Job. Tom, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Colin. Before we dive into your article, why don't you just give us a little background about yourself and your experience for our audience? Okay, sure. So I've um, worked in IT and cybersecurity. It's over 35 years now. And the beginning of my career was primarily focused on a lot of uh, different technical areas. So I I started off writing code, then I uh, did a lot of systems programming work on various IBM platforms for a number of years. And um, in the course of that, I was supporting a product called MQ Series and IBM needed to have a security standard created for that. So I volunteered to do that. And that was kind of my entrance into the security world. Uh, that was around the year 2000. And then from there, I just kind of progressed and began doing more and more security related activities until that became my full time job. And over the last few years, I've focused more on the audit support and governance. But I um, have that technical background there. So I feel like I kind of have seen both sides of the of the arena. Nice. So what actually got you interested into this specific topic? So um, a few years ago, I was, I was doing some audit support, and one of the things I would run into a lot would be I'd have to send requests over to the IT teams, and when I would send those over, I always felt like it was fairly challenging to get them engaged and get responses back. And then I realized pretty quickly that you know, supporting, providing evidence, doing um, compliance work, providing audit evidence, that really wasn't anything that was, I'm sure it wasn't in their job descriptions and probably wasn't something that their management ever talked to them about very much. So I realized this isn't really something that the people I'm working with consider to be like a primary part of their job. They're kind of seeing this as this added thing that somebody's reaching out to them about and, and it's kind of a distraction from what they consider their real work to be. And at the time, I was thinking, wow, it'd be really great if um, I could get this added to their job responsibilities so that they would be aware that this is something that would be coming coming along, something they would need to respond to. And so when I saw this uh, position description get, get added into NIST 853, it kind of really resonated because it fed back to my personal experience. And, and I um, could really see the value of calling out security and privacy related responsibilities in someone's job description. I agree. I, I think that it is everybody's responsibility and not just cybersecurity people to be aware, be cyber conscious, be security conscious about what's going on. So yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on that. Um, what are benefits to the organization from considering what cybersecurity and privacy roles and also responsibilities should be added to position descriptions? So I think there's a few different benefits. Um, one of the obvious ones is it just helps to clarify responsibilities. And then I think another thing is if there's multiple teams that are involved in a task, it can help to delineate who's really responsible for what. And then I think the other, other thing is it helps to kind of instill that culture of cybersecurity through the organization. So kind of, Going back around through those three, I think with clarifying responsibilities, it it just gives the organization a, a good opportunity to understand who really needs to do what. So I think like you were alluding to before, there's just some general responsibilities for cybersecurity that everyone has in an organization. So uh, be aware when you're responding to emails, be aware of like websites that you visit. But then uh, more specific, like role-based responsibilities, it's, it's good to call those out as well. And that kind of leads naturally into any role-based training that is needed for position, depending on the responsibilities that are identified. And it could even lead really into helping define um, access requirements in a role-based access control environment. If you're being more specific about what somebody's doing 
within your job description. And then as far as uh, where there's multiple teams involved in a task, one of the things I've observed really through, through my career is that if, if there's multiple teams that are res have responsibilities to complete some task, but there's not really anything that's kind of describing who's exactly doing what or who has overall ownership for the job, then typically that task isn't going to get completed very well. And if there's no one that is the ultimate oversight, more than likely it's just going to kind of fizzle out somewhere along the way. And then finally, going on to the topic of culture, I think um, calling out just general responsibilities everyone has towards cybersecurity and then specific cybersecurity and privacy uh, tasks for an individual role, helping to call those out again, that contributes to uh, getting everyone on board with the task of securing the enterprise. I agree. So why is it significant that NIST included the PS9 position descriptions control in all three of the security control baselines? So uh, that's that's a good question. So uh, within 853, there's, there's the three different control baselines. There's low, moderate, and high. And uh, people may be familiar with those in part from the FedRAMP. Uh, specifications because typically you're looking at either FedRAMP moderate or FedRAMP PI if you're looking at a, a some kind of a cloud offering where FedRAMP applies. And so what those baselines are, they're basically just sets of controls uh, that are um, aligned with security and privacy risks. So uh, an organization with a relatively low level of risk is going to come in with a low baseline. Typically, I think most organizations would be in moderate. And then high is for um, government entities typically that have a need for a very high level of security. And so the fact that NIST included uh, this, this control PS9 for position descriptions and all three of those baselines basically is just them saying that this is something that's essential for any organization. So anyone using NIST 853 would be expected to include this new requirement. Um, do you think that cybersecurity is treated the same as other responsibilities, such as physical safety or ethical conduct? So I think that's that's an interesting topic because um, I think in a lot of organizations, there's still a mindset like cybersecurity basically belongs to the CISO who are, or whoever is fulfilling that role and the people that report to them. So there's still a mindset like somehow the CISO and their team can make the organization secure without necessarily having a lot of cooperation from everybody else in the organization. And I think if we look at something like uh, physical safety or we look at like ethics, you know, obviously there wouldn't be that kind of mindset. So th there may be like a chief risk officer and, and maybe OSHA and insurance fall under that person but there wouldn't be an expectation that that person can make the organization secure on their own without the active participation of, of other people within that company. And similarly with ethics, you may have like a chief ethics officer or a chief compliance officer, but you wouldn't expect that that person can somehow make the organization ethical if other people aren't really engaged within trying to model ethical behavior. So. I think with cybersecurity, I don't know that we're there yet. And I think that's uh, one of the things that, you know, calling out cyber and privacy responsibilities and job can, description can help to do is to drive home the point that this is something that takes everybody's engagement for the organization to really implement. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, so you mentioned the publication from NICE, cybersecurity is everyone's job. Can we talk about it? Sure. So NICE is the uh, National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. It's um, a, a branch of NIST. And they have this publication they put out a couple years ago, uh, Cybersecurity is Everyone's Job. And it's, it's a really nice publication in that it runs through uh, seven different business functions and calls out a fairly long list of cybersecurity-related responsibilities for all those areas. So the, the functions a lot of times include like multiple teams. So there's one for leadership planning and governance, which is kind of like a, 
C-suite, senior management board of directors, you know, what are their tasks? And so one of the things that calls out is um, not treating cybersecurity risk as some separate and mysterious matter only for the technology people. And then it goes through other areas like sales, marketing, communications, uh, physical security, finance administration, human resources, legal and compliance. And for all those different business functions, it's calling out responsibilities for those areas. So I think it's really a great publication just to kind of drive home the point that there's a lot of different areas in the organization beyond IT or cybersecurity that, that have a, a p- pretty big role to play in securing the enterprise. So what do you think are the best ways that um, you know leadership can help their employees to be more cyber conscious? So um, that's, that's a good question. And, and obviously, pretty much like anything else within an organization, it's really not typically going to, you're not going to make a lot of progress if you don't have that leadership from senior management and you don't have senior management kind of modeling the behavior that you want the organization to have. So as far as uh, cybersecurity roles and responsibilities, then I would say one thing you're looking for is for senior management to be engaged and for them to be taking on any responsibilities within cybersecurity that naturally fall to them. And that would be you know, providing leadership, uh, providing oversight, making sure that things are being done the way they ought to be done. Uh, making sure resources are available, you've got the necessary staff, that staff's getting the necessary training, uh, where where it's applicable, they're getting funding to get the tools that are needed. And, and then as far as the topic we're on now, like position descriptions and spelling out roles and responsibilities, uh, I will look for management to kind of drive that task down through the organization. So making sure that those responsibilities are called out on all the all the position descriptions throughout the organization where appropriate. So what do you think about incentives and decentives about for employees that don't cooperate with security practices? Because in the end, I think that um, humans are the real issue when it comes to security. So as far as um, basic things that would be important for anybody at, at the organization, it's like being aware of phishing, being aware of uh, business email compromise, being careful about what websites you visit. Uh, you know, typically most organizations in their employee handbook or somewhere in their policy are going to spell out uh, sanctions policy. So that would be if somebody's you know fairly egregiously violating your acceptable use policy um, or their having an issue where even after training about phishing, they're still not being careful with uh, links that they're clicking on in emails, then I will look to the sanctions policy to kind of lead someone progressively through. (laughs) These are the different things you're going to face. So, you know, level one, you may get a reprimand, level two, something more than that. And typically most organizations are going to, in their sanctions policy, clarify that it, that it can go up to and including termination if what you've done is really egregious. For more general or or less general uh, responsibilities, like um, cybersecurity roles and responsibilities that are specific to a particular job, like that may be um, ensuring that someone's terminated within your um, HR system of record on their last day of employment. If that is either falling to your HR department or to your personnel managers, Doing that um, consistently and doing it within the time frame that be specified, obviously that can be called out as something where uh, fulfilling that responsibility is tied to your compensation. So maybe some part of your bonus is tied to doing that 95% of the time or 99% of the time, whatever uh, level of, of um, compliance that you want to put there. That would be another way where you can tie compensation directly to someone fulfilling their cyber related responsibilities. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on the fact that I think that cybersecurity should be everyone's job. I, I find it hard that even though it might be in their job description, at least for a little while, that people are still going to 
not be clicking on on links in emails and getting attacked and and things like that that way just because of human error yeah that's always a challenge so that um, kind of goes into another topic that's related to this which is training so it's one thing to have expectations for how your organization's staff is going to behave either at the most basic kind of um you know, not falling for phishing emails, not falling victim to business email compromise, those kind of general responsibilities, and then also going on to more specific role-based responsibilities. It's important to have training that's going to call out what you're expecting people to do, how you're expecting them to behave, and giving them advice on things that they need to be aware of and need to avoid in order to stay safe within the environment. So about your article, is there anything that you didn't get to mention in your article? It got to call out pretty many of the things I, I had intended to. I think, you know, there's a few anecdotes that I, I didn't include just because they kind of fall more into the first person category. Uh, one of those was kind of the lead thing where I was talking about when I was supporting audits and, you know, realizing that people I was interacting with didn't, didn't have anything related to that audit support called out within their job descriptions. Another thing that that came up also in my experience that, that was kind of interesting was uh, with backup and recovery, uh, I was engaged with um, the backup team and talking to them. And I realized, you know, these are very sa savvy tech people and they really understand the different tools they're working with and how they can configure them. But as far as what exactly needs to be backed up and how long you need to retain it, that really falls over to the uh, the business people to help advise advise them on that. And when I was talking with with the IT backup team, I realized they're not really engaging with the business people. And then when I go talk to the business people, I realized, well, they're really just viewing this as all IT stuff. I'm assuming you know the IT people are taking care of this because this is IT's responsibility. And there was really this lack of communication between the two teams. And what I did um, in this one instance, bring these two teams together was, was pretty interesting because the, the backup folks were backing up like development servers that probably didn't really need to be backed up. And they weren't really aware of like retention requirements. They were still waiting to get those from the business people. So it's one of those instances where um, it was good to get both teams together. But I think that's something that could be called out in, in job responsibilities as well is that um, business team needs to engage with the IT folks and the IT folks need to, to get, engage with the business people to make sure that they're getting all the requirements that they need to get. Yeah. On, on a general level, uh, when it comes to training and awareness, is there anything that you've seen that stands out or something that's creative uh, that, that you think really stuck with uh, when it comes to cybersecurity training for employees? Um, there's nothing I could particularly cite, I guess. What I would say is I think it's important that training relates to the organization. So uh, training specific to the kinds of data and the sort of scenarios that the organization and their staff might be involved in. I think a lot of times uh, training tends to be fairly generic. So I think anything that makes it more specific to the, the organization or the person in their particular job is going to be helpful. And I think um, one of the things, you know, a lot of organizations do where they're doing phishing simulations. And again, there, if you're gearing those simulations more specifically towards the kind of work that the organization's doing, that's going to be something that's going to be helpful. One thing I guess we didn't talk about, so would be risk to an organization if they don't really call out cybersecurity and privacy responsibilities. And... Um, one of the things I would I would say is important if if you're not really being specific about who's responsible for what, and this is a, a particularly important where you're getting into role based responsibilities. If you're not adding details around who who needs to do what into job descriptions, then more than likely a lot of people may agree there's something that's important and it needs to get done, but if that's not being assigned to anyone in particular, then more than likely it's not not going to be done. And so that's always a risk for organizations is things like, you know, backing up your servers, making sure um, 
staff gets terminated and their access revokes when they're leaving the organization, making sure their access gets um, redone if they transfer within the organization. Those are all really critical things. And if you're not calling out who needs to be doing those, then again, more than likely, they're not going to be getting completed. So that's that's a big risk for organizations. So you've talked about role-based access control. Do you want to explain that on a, on a basic level uh, for our audience or for anybody who doesn't quite know what that is? Sure. So role-based access control is the idea that you're tying what an individual has access to basically back to what their job is. And so again, then again, that goes back to job responsibilities. So it, it should be a way to uh, help to enforce least privilege. So you're tying access to only what a person really needs to have access to within their job. And it's also a cleaner way to do access. So if you're not using role-based, then the danger is you're doing more ad hoc assignments where you're just kind of giving this person access to various things. And maybe the person sitting next to them that's doing more or less the same job ends up with access to a different set of things. That's not being configured in a consistent way. So within within whatever your uh, the tool is that you're using to configure access control, that that's you're defining different profiles for different people. And so there's it's harder to manage, harder to clean up, and it's um, easier to, to over over provide access and, and um, kind of over specify things and give people access to a lot of stuff that they don't need. So again, role based is a way to, to try to address that by only giving access to items that are necessary for a particular role within a particular part of the company. Well, we could talk about this stuff for a lot longer, but that's all the time that we have left, unfortunately. Uh, Tom, I just want to say thank you again for chatting with me today. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more, you can click the link in the episode details uh, to access Tom's full ISACA journal article. Uh, Again, my name is Colin Metter, and thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks, Colin. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Page to Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. 